Amen. If you would bow your heads with me this morning as we open God's word. Father, we do thank you that in your presence, that at the foot of your throne, all indeed is well. We acknowledge that we face problems in life. We face challenges in life. Sometimes, practically speaking, all is not well. Loss of loved one, sickness, unforeseen obstacles that we encounter in life. And though in this world it may seem that all is not well, we know that in your presence all is well because you are sovereign, because you are good, because you are holy and because you have a plan even when we don't see it. As we open your word this morning and as we celebrate this Christmas season with remembering your entry into the world, would you draw your deep truths out of your word? Would you challenge us? Would you open our eyes and would you open our ears and would you help us to listen? We ask your blessing this morning and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would turn me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I must beg your forgiveness this morning. My voice and cough is not, uh, my voice is not returned and the cough has not totally gone away. So I have a handheld mic to remove it from my mouth in case I begin to cough to save your ears. But I would appreciate your prayers that God would sustain my voice through this service and through the next. Matthew chapter 4, down to verse 17, is a passage that we may not oftentimes talk about during the Christmas season. Christmas season, we talk about the entry of Christ into the world as a baby. And as we come to this passage in our study through Matthew, I actually can think of a few passages that maybe play better into the Christmas season. As we look at this passage, we are reminded of God's promises. We're reminded of God's plan to bring his son transcending heaven into earth to show us God, to show us the kingdom. One very simple question this morning that as we read this passage and as we study this passage that I want you to ask is are you ready to listen? See the light has come, the Messiah has come, but are you ready to listen to him? This goes beyond willingness. You know, are, are you willing to follow God? Are you willing to listen? See, we have way too many Christians who are willing to follow and are not following, who are willing to listen but are not listening. Christmas is a time to remind us about what God did to bring his son to show us that we could be reconciled to the Father. And as I read this passage and as we come to our study in Matthew and in the spring we come to Matthew 5 and Jesus begins his sermon preaching on the kingdom, again I ask the question, are we ready to listen? See, some of us, we've been waiting in life. God, I'm willing to follow. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And we're sitting back waiting for that cone of light. We're waiting for that voice to speak from heaven. Go and do thus. And since that voice has not happened and the heavens have not parted and we have this clear will and path for our life, we lean back into our chair and we continue to say, God, I'm willing. Just show me what you want. Instead of the word of God is clear what he wants. The question is, are we going to follow? Are we going to listen? Are we gonna obey? Today I wanna talk about are you willing to listen and then next Sunday I wanna talk about are you willing to follow? Are you ready to follow? Are you going to follow? Let's read down from verse 12 down to verse 17. 
Jesus has just come out of the wilderness being tempted by Satan. This is just prior to the start of his ministry. And in verse 12, it says this. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus stands up before the crowds. Are you listening? The time to be reconciled to God is now. Eternity is here. The kingdom of God has begun to arrive. Are you listening? Are you ready to respond? You know, the difference of listening and just hearing really is a matter of intention on your part. I remember in uh, high school or secondary school in Africa, my high school buddies, we went and we learned to scuba dive together and we were getting our advanced scuba license and we were learning to do a deep dive. A deep dive is where there is uh, decompression. You have to come up and when you come back to the surface, you have to come back in increments so that you don't overexpand your lungs. You don't pop a lung. It can be very dangerous because you're going down so deep. And I remember that we're sitting there, you know, it's seven high school guys, you know, and when you're 18, what do you think? You think that you own the world. You think that nothing can hurt you. And so he's giving these instructions. You're kind of leaning back in your chair going, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we got it, we got it. But the instructor at one point during our prep lesson before going on our first deep dive, he snapped his fingers. Guys, he's from South Africa. He said, guys, guys, listen to me. This is very serious. Do, you, do I have your attention? At that point, we kind of rose up and looked at him. He said, listen to me. If something goes wrong, do not swim for the surface. Whatever you do, do not swim for the surface. You won't make it. You will die trying. Suddenly that got our attention. He said, whatever you do, if, you're, if your oxygen stops flowing, if your mass fills with water, no matter what you do, do not swim for the surface. You will run out of air before you get there, and even if you do make it to the surface, you may pop a lung, or you may get bubbles in your bloodstream and cause a heart attack or a stroke in your brain. At that point, our attention, he had grabbed our attention. Because of the severity of the instructions, because of, of the reality of the consequences, if we chose to ignore them. I remember when I was on a shallow dive, and I had to do an emergency surface because my, my tank stopped working, my air stopped flowing. And just going just that 30 feet and having to do an emergency blow to the surface, all of a sudden I got to the top, my mask was just filled with blood because my sinuses had opened up and the blood was draining out, and that got my attention. I thought going three, four times that depth, I better listen to the instructor because he knows what he's talking about. Jesus is crying out to the crowds in this momentous Kairos moment, this, this specific moment in time in history where he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. It's coming. See, when Jesus came, he began to inaugurate the kingdom. It came in part, and the kingdom is still in part, but it doesn't come in whole until he returns a second time. But the kingdom of heaven, the reality of eternity, is here. Are you going to listen? When you read this statement, verse 17, this is the thesis statement of the Gospel of Matthew. It's the main point of the Gospel of Matthew. This verse, underline it, circle it, star it. This is the point on which Jesus will spend the rest of Matthew expounding. See, as we read through the Bible, there are different verses oftentimes throughout the books that are kind of the key points in each book and in the book of Romans. We learned that a couple of years ago, Romans 1.17. For the righteous shall live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. 
This was his thesis statement right there in chapter one, and the rest of Romans is spent unpacking that concept. That those who are justified before God, those who are made righteous, live on a basis of grace through faith. Here, the theme of Matthew is repent, be reconciled to God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the manifestation of the revelation of the king and his kingdom. This is the central thought. So the rest of the passage we're going to be hearing, Matthew's going to continue to reveal to us that Jesus is the king, the Messiah. He's going to continue to talk to us about what kingdom living looks like. And in Matthew chapter 5, when we delve into this in depth, Jesus is going to be talking about what does real kingdom living, what does the kingdom servant look like? And there's some hard truths are we going to listen to him when he talks? Are we ready to hear him? See, Matthew is about to unfold before us like a flower blooming in season. And one of the things that I want to challenge you as a preacher, as a pastor, as my church here, my beloved, is that for every petal that we unfold in this bloom that is the gospel of Matthew, that we're saying, what does this mean about God? What does it tell me about God? And how should I live then in relationship with God? And as this flower of Matthew blooms, that we can begin to smell the scent of its fragrance and the beauty of God's grace that is woven from Matthew 1 all the way to the end of Matthew 28. Because the beauty of God's grace in this book runs so deep. And the power that Jesus begins to talk about it, he begins in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach the word keruso, proclaim, to, to publicly declare. He's not just walking up over a cup of coffee. He is standing up and saying, do you not realize that the kingdom of God is coming? And that the decisions you make will have eternal ramifications and implications. So are you ready to listen? See, preaching is the job of the pastor. J.I. Packer says the purpose of preaching is to inform, persuade, and call forth an appropriate response to the God whose message and instruction are being delivered. My desire as a preacher is not simply to fill your head with chicken noodle soup for the soul, but to stand up here and says, thus says the God of heaven. This is what the Bible says. G. Campbell Morgan, a great preacher, said, the supreme work of the Christian minister is the work of preaching. This is a day in which we are tempted to the great perils of doing a thousand little things to the neglect of the one thing, and that is preaching the whole counsel of God. And I can validate that, how easy it is as a preacher, as a pastor, to be get caught up in the little things of life instead of recognizing and proclaiming the reality and the truth of God and his kingdom. But see, we're so busy running around building our own little kingdoms, aren't we? What we want in life, what we want to accomplish, our dreams, our goals, our strategic vision, instead of sitting down and saying, God, what do you want of me as you build your kingdom? John Chrysostom, who was an early church father in 347, born in 347 AD, a couple of centuries after the time of Christ, was known for his great eloquence. He was called the golden-mouthed preacher. And he spoke to his congregation one day, and as he spoke to his congregation, they were praising him for his eloquence and preaching. And he responded and said this, you praise what I have said and receive my exhortation with tumults of applause, but show your appreciation by obedience. Don't just listen, don't just hear but show your appreciation by obedience. That is the only praise that I seek, said John Chrysostom. As Jesus calls out to us and Jesus preaches and proclaims the reality of the kingdom, 
It is a pertinent reminder to us that true appreciation and worship of God is shown in our obedience. How far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to follow Christ? Let's go back to verse 12. Let's see a man who is willing, willing to give up everything for the sake of following. As we come to verse 12, we come to a man named John the Baptist, a man who listened, a man who was willing to give everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now it says this, verse 12, when he heard that John had been arrested, stop there. I do not want you to miss the drama of this moment in this narrative. That Jesus comes on the scene, that John has been proclaiming in the wilderness, and he himself was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John fully believed what he was preaching. Jesus is in the wilderness being confronted by Satan, being attacked by Satan. And is it no mystery that right here at the beginning of the ministry of Christ, that John, The greatest witness, the forerunner of the Messiah himself, is arrested by the governing authorities. As you're beginning your ministry, I just got ordained to become a preacher, or I'm just ready to follow God. And the minute that you step out ready to follow, ready to begin your ministry, the mayor of Lynchburg has you arrested for proclaiming the truth. Now, all of those who are around you, all of your friends, they're going to think twice, aren't they? Am I I willing to pay the same cost? Right up here in verse 12, before the ministry of Jesus has even begun, the cost of following Christ is even evident. That the drama of this environment, that Jesus is about to proclaim the kingdom, and right off the bat, proclaiming the kingdom could mean his arrest. Why was John arrested? John was arrested because he cried out against the sins of King Herod Antipas. Not Herod the Great, but Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was a debauched, evil man. He fell in love with his half-brother's wife, Herodias. Herodias reciprocated the feelings. So Herod Antipas divorced his wife. Herodias divorced her husband, And Herod Antipas and Herodias got married in an adulterous affair. John, who was a true speaker, stood up and he said, it is not lawful for you to have this woman. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand John. I don't want you to think that this is some sort of angry fist preaching of of berating Herod Antipas because we know from chapter 3 that John the Baptist was an extremely humble man. Yes, he spoke with authority, but there was great humility entwined in that authority. So there was great proclamation, but it was not one of vindictiveness. It was one of humble authority that it is not right before God that this sin be allowed to endure. And for that boldness, he was arrested. And by the way, you're going to see later in Matthew, he was never released. And eventually in that prison, He was unceremoniously beheaded. What are you willing to pay? What are you willing to give for the sake of Christ and his kingdom? There are thousands of believers all over the world who are paying that price. I was watching a documentary on North Korea And uh, a former guard in one of the concentration camps in North Korea was able to escape to South Korea and eventually became a Christian. And he said there were people imprisoned in these family camps because they were Christians. It's estimated that maybe 100,000 Christians are imprisoned in labor camps across North Korea. He remembered witnessing... Five children, five, six, seven years old, starving to death and finding a kernel of corn in a pile of cow dung. They pulled it out and he watched those five children fight over that one kernel of corn to see who got to eat it. He said the conditions were horrendous. 
things that we can't even comprehend. And he said, I quote, that you cannot understand it unless you have been there and you have seen it. But there are Christians who have chosen to follow Christ rather than have the kernel of corn. What are we willing to give? What are we willing to do to follow? John was ready to give everything. He was willing to pay everything. That's why he didn't recant even when he was arrested. He did not pull back, but he stood firm on truth. And there is coming a day, mark my words, that it is very soon when certain things that I say from this pulpit will not be politically correct and we will risk fines, lawsuits, and maybe even imprisonment in this country. And at that point, we will find here in this congregation, church, and I beloved, I hope we don't lose one, but we will find who is really serious about their faith at that point. You don't wait until it comes to make the decision. You make the decision now and say that I am willing to listen, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to follow, I'm willing to pay whatever price is necessary for Christ and his kingdom. Because 70, 80, 90 years is a blink of an eye in the scheme of eternity. John was willing to pay it all. Now, Jesus, when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Now, Nazareth was the place where Jesus grew up. From the escarpment of Nazareth, he would have been able to see the caravans and the peoples passing in and out of Israel. But he relocated from Nazareth and went li lived in Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee. And this becomes his home base for ministry for now the bulk of his ministry through the Gospel of Matthew. And he's going to do a lot of his ministry right here around the Sea of Galilee. Now Capernaum means Kephar Nahum in Hebrew, which means house of Nahum. And many have speculated that Capernaum is the historical birthplace or the home of the prophet Nahum. It's speculation at this point, but that's what traditionalists say. But Jesus moves to this place of ministry. He settles there, and then it says this, Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, I find this very fascinating. I say, why is this fascinating? Zebulun and Naphtali are the promised tribal allotments of the promised land. The tribe of Zebulun, this is where it was, they were promised, and Naphtali, this is where they were promised. But see, this is very important. Zebulun and Naphtali do not exist during this time period. There is no Zebulun. There is no Naphtali. It's under Greek control and then under Roman control. It's not the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. They're scattered all over Judea. They're scattered all over the diaspora of the Mediterranean world. The, the dispersion, the, the diaspora, it's what it means. They're all over the place. The traditional lands of Zebulun and Naphtali, as God had given them, do not exist here. So why does Matthew, instead of saying the region of Tiberias, which is this area, or the region of Scythopolis, the major Greek cities, why does he bring out Zebulun and Naphtali? As you read through Matthew, we've already been through Matthew 1 through Matthew 4. There are so many Old Testament references. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus faced Satan, every single one of Jesus' rebukes came out of Deut Deuteronomy, and they were quotations from the Old Testament. In chapter 3, John the Baptist was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Chapter 2, uh, the birth and the arrival of Christ is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So why this Old Testament reference to Zebulun and Naphtali? You see, the reason that Zebulun and Naphtali are not in existence here is because the people of Israel disobeyed God again and again and again. And eventually they were carried away by the Assyrians to the north and the Babylonians down to the east. But here, Jesus' return is marked by a reminder that Jesus, that God, is going to restore the land to the people of Israel. 
that this region of Naphtali and Zebulun, that's not just past history, but it's coming again. He is gonna fulfill his promise, he's gonna bring salvation, and he's gonna restore that which was destroyed. This is amazing to me. Because what we see here is a persistent grace. And I love this phrase. Because God has a persistent grace. That the mention of Naphtali and, and Zebulun are reminders that God is still pursuing his people. That in spite of the fact that they have turned away from God, that he is still pursuing them. Jesus comes, he doesn't say, oh, you guys are old hat, I'm moving on to the Gentiles, which he is reaching out to us, thank God. But he's saying, even though you forsook me, I am keeping my promise, and I'm gonna keep pursuing you. My grace is persistent, it's pursuing. It's not about what you do, it's about who I am. And I'm going to keep my promise regardless of whether you do or not. What a great reminder. You know, are you listening this morning? See, this is one of those, are, are you ready to listen? Are you ready to listen and to be reminded that God's grace and mercy towards you is persistent? That he doesn't give up on you? That he keeps pursuing you? That unto your grave. He is still pursuing you. Pastor, I've done so many things. Like, I, I, Why would God continue to pursue me? I don't know the answer to that, but I just simply know that God loves you so much that he is still pursuing you. One of the things in the reminder of Christmas is that God's Arrival as a baby is a reminder that God in his persistent grace kept pursuing us, though thousands of years ago we already deserved justice. We already deserved his condemnation. So Jesus goes to Capernaum to the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali to remind us that he's not done with his people to fulfill prophecy of the prophet Isaiah as well. And look at verse 15, verse 16. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Turn with me to Isaiah 9. It's fascinating that both quotations, these are two different quotes. Verse 15 is out of Isaiah 9. And verse 16 is out of Isaiah 42. Both of which, by the way, are passages we love to talk about at Christmas. Jesus has removed himself up to Capernaum. He is there to begin his ministry. And he goes there to fulfill prophecy and also to remind the people of Israel and the world that God's grace is persistent. He's not done with his people. He's going to restore the land. He's going to restore the promise is that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the direct prophecy that he's fulfilling is Isaiah 9, which, by the way, is some 700 years before the time of Christ. Look at verse 1. Isaiah is writing, and he says, There will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Jesus is coming. He hasn't forgot his people. His grace is persistent. And who is this one that's coming to Zebulun and Naphtali? Look at verse six. It's the child, the Messiah child. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it. This is a messianic text. And I should point out that Isaiah, in Isaiah 9, is preaching to the northern land of Israel during a time when Israel was in absolute rejection of God. It was not just a few years after this was preached by Isaiah. 
that the northern kingdom of Israel was carried off into captivity in the mid seventh century BC by the kingdom of Assyria. But even while they were rebelling against God, God gives a promise that he is going to send a light in the darkness, a Messiah. Harkens back to Romans 5, doesn't it? For while we were yet, what? Sinners. Christ, what? Died for us. God's grace comes before our obedience, otherwise it would not be grace. God gives his favor and his mercy and pursues us before we even begin to pursue him. He is pursuing Israel, though for the next 700 years they would turn their back on him. But Jesus coming into Capernaum is a fulfillment of prophecy and a visual reminder that God does not give up on sinners. Pursuing them. The second part of the prophecy, turn to Isaiah 42 if you would. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 is another messianic text promising of the king and the kingdom. It says in verse one, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations that is certainly fulfilled in Christ. The Christ is the very manifestation of God. And then in verse six, here's the direct, or the, the paraphrastic quote that Jesus, that is given in Matthew four. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light to the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Jesus came to bring light. Jesus came to bring hope. Jesus came to bring mercy. Jesus came to bring peace. Peace with who? Peace with God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he also comes and brings a warning. A warning that God has come, but eternity is at hand. Therefore, now is the hour of salvation. Christians, now is the time to follow. Now is the time to begin living for eternity. You do not begin living for eternity tomorrow. You start living for eternity right now. And every decision that you make, and every word that is spoken, and every ambition that is pursued, eternity is lived for right now. Turn back to Matthew 4, if you would. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus brings truth. John chapter 1. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Please listen to me very clearly. In the postmodern church today, mystery is what is embraced. God is unknowable. He is, um, I cannot, he, we just have to keep searching. There's, there's, there's no anchor point of truth. We need to keep pursuing this mystical notion of God. There's no authoritative revelation. This is what is rife through the postmodern church today. Now let me qualify a couple of things. Is there mystery to God? Yes or no? Absolutely. There's tremendous mystery about God. There's tremendous mystery about eternity. But does the presence or the existence of mystery nullify objective truth? And the answer is no. We have not been revealed all of eternity. We have not been revealed the full character of God. Number one, it's an impossibility. An unknowable, infinite God cannot be captured by the finite mind. But the fact that God is infinite, that God is majestic, doesn't mean that we don't know anything hard fact about him. Pastor, where are you going with this? 
Listen, it breaks my heart when I see the postmodern church make determinations that ultimately, guys, it's what you believe about God. Rob Bell, we, know, we all know, probably most of you know, he kind of led the postmodern movement in the last decade or so, and he has renounced many of the basic doctrines, came out of Eddie Dobson's church, uh, began Orthodox, and then very quickly went into heresy even because he embraced a mystery only without any objective or authoritative truth. The man who took over from Rob Bell, took over his megachurch, is a man by the name of Kent Dobson, Eddie Dobson's son. Kent Dobson, just a few weeks ago, stood up before his church and announced that he was stepping down from the pastorate, not because of moral failure or issues, but he stood up and he said, I want everybody to know that I just, I live on the edges of faith. And God is something that we ultimately just can't express that we can't know. So I'm gonna go off on a journey and I'm gonna pursue my own path and my own experience about who God is and what he wants of my life. Now please hear me out. I am not assaulting Kent Dobson. I have prayed for him numerous times because my heart breaks for where he's at spiritually and the thousands that he is now leading astray because of his position. By the way, Kent Dobson was also the editor of the first century archaeological study Bible for Zondervan. This is a man who knows his stuff, but has come to the point where I need to go out and experience God for myself. The elder, after he stepped up, came up after the church, and she said, she said, uh, spiritual maturity looks like this. Just waiting on God. And then she got down. Spiritual maturity does look like waiting on God. But spiritual maturity is waiting on God through his revealed authoritative truth. God is a mystery. But we do have a word, a book here that tells us who God is, what he expects of our life, how we are to live, and how we are to come into relationship with God. That is not a mystery. That is revealed divine revelation that Jesus died for, that thousands have paid for their blood with over the centuries and millennia of the church. Do not embrace the concept of a complete unknowable God. See, the deception and the power of a lie is partial truth. God is unknowable. But that which what we need to know about God has been revealed to us through his inerrant word. And we can anchor ourselves into that. And by the way, there's a subtle reference here. The fact that he went into Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled so that even Matthew here and Jesus is giving authority that Isaiah, the prophet, is the revealed word of God. Postmodernism embraces relativity. Scriptural humility recognizes that I'm not God, there are mystery about God, but scriptural humility recognizes though that I do have a word from God and I can trust it absolutely. And this word tells us to listen that there is a Messiah who has physically come, he has physically lived among us, and he is proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do we do this? How do we listen? How how do we embrace this sunrise of truth, this light of truth that is Christ? By adhering to his word. Knowing that what the word teaches is is the truth. That it brings light. That Jesus brings light, not mystery. Jesus brings truth, not confusion. Jesus brings certainty not ambiguity. 
But see, the people sitting under Kent Dobson walked away from that Sunday with something that you can't really be sure of anything, that God is ambiguous and there is no ultimate hope and certainty in our lives. Listen to the warning here. That God is pursuing, that God is persistent, that God has promised his truth. But also listen to the warning. Jesus preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's grace is persistent. Live for eternity, but also understand this, that eternity is at hand. That means at any time Christ could return. That means at any time Jesus may call you home. And if you do not know Christ, at any time you could enter eternity. So there's a warning here. Don't wait. If you wait till eternity, it's too late. Believer, if you wait till your deathbed to begin following Jesus, what missed opportunity there is. Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to hear from him what he wants for your life? Because it's not mystery, it's not ambiguous. We're gonna be walking through Matthew with great detail about what God wants for your life. But are you listening or are you leaning back in your chair like we were with our instructor? Yeah, 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 I heard this before, I know it, da-da-da. Or are you this time ready to listen? How many times does God have to knock on your life before you will listen? How much does he have to rattle your cage before you will listen? You have no idea how much God loves you. How much God is pursuing you right now, but will you heed his call? Pastor, what do I do? How do I listen? You know, there's something I call the Papa prayer. You know, we can come to our Father as Abba. Abba Father. This is the Papa prayer. I can come to my God and I pee, pursue him fervently. God, what do you want for my life? Okay, next on to the football game. Which Packers beat Detroit Lions? Praise God, there's a God. Amen. Great call at the end of the game. Anyways, pursue fervently. Do not just simply go through life here and there asking, okay, God, what do you want? No, pursue fervently. God, what do you want of me today? Where do you want me 10 years from now? Number two, ask scripturally. God, I really want a $70 million yacht. Probably not gonna happen. Hate to burst your bubble. Ask scripturally. P, plead humbly. Continue to plead, recognizing that you cannot unless he does, that you cannot succeed unless God grants the power, that God will not bless unless it is his will. To recognize your complete desperation and need for him. And the last one, act courageously. See, here, here's the one that I feel that we fail at at times. God, I'm willing, God, I'm willing, God, I'm listening, God, I'm willing. At some point, you gotta get out there and just do at some point, you got to get out there and just follow. He has called you to be witnesses. He's called you to be holy. He's called you to be representatives. He's called you to be compassionate. He's called you to be loving. God, show me if, if I need to be loving today. There is no if. Plead fervently. God, help me to be loving scripturally. God, help me to be sacrificial in my love. Plead humbly, God, I cannot be loving unless you empower me to be loving. Act courageously. I'm gonna make mistakes, but you know what? I'm gonna do it anyway, and I'm gonna follow, and even if I do make a mistake, I know God is with me. The Papa prayer. Come to your Abba and ask him. See, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Eternity is at hand. Start living for eternity now. How do I start living for an eternity? As a realtor, as a stay-at-home mom, as a whatever your vocation is, pursue God. Ask him. Plead humbly. And then act. Follow. We'll talk about that more next week. See, God is a light. He brings clarity to our life, not ambiguity. 
He brings light to the nations, to the Galilee of the Gentiles, to the Jordan, to the Zebulun, to the Naphtali. He's pursuing us. He's pursuing people. And he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. It's not the postmodern, if you follow God, just feel your way and just hope you're going to find something out there. No. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If there is ambiguity in your life, if there is question about what direction God has for you, you know what? He may delay telling you to teach you to trust him, but God will show it through his word. He will lead, he will direct for how to live for eternity. See, the light has come. Are you ready to listen? Very simple question. Are you ready to listen? Jesus is calling, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Eternity is here. And the rest of Matthew, we're gonna be unpacking that about what that means. But are you ready to listen? Would you stand with me this morning? And let's pray. Oh, Father. We do ask for your grace and your strength to lead us and to teach us. And if there's somebody here who does not know you, would you not let them leave without coming and talking to me or to someone else here who knows you so they can make a decision for eternity. And for the rest of us, Father, would you help us today to start living for eternity? And every action, every word, every comment, may it betray, may it showcase that we are followers of Christ. Lord, at this Christmas, remind us of how you've pursued us so persistently, how your grace has been so fervent. And may we rejoice in the hope that we have in your word that what you say is true. May you be exalted, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless See you this evening at 6 o'clock. Don't miss it. Old-fashioned Christmas with Dr. Kroll. Have a blessed afternoon.